Hi, I'm Jeff Holden. Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast Network. Our purpose and passion is to highlight a nonprofit organization in each weekly episode, giving that organization an opportunity to tell their story in their words to better inform and educate the respective communities they serve, as well as provide one more tool for them to share their message to constituents and donors. Our goal is to help build stronger communities through shared voices and to both encourage and support the growth of local nonprofit organizations through podcasting. Thanks to our founding partners for their foresight in helping us transform the way conversations start. Cap Trust, fiduciary advice for endowments and foundations. Runyon Saltzman Incorporated, RSE, marketing, advertising, and public relations creating integrated communications committed to improving lives. And Western Health Advantage, a full-service health care plan for individuals, employer groups, and families. It's been called autism, intellectual developmental disability, on the spectrum, but more appropriately, it's neurodiversity. And while a disability on one hand, it can be an opportunity on the other. However, that won't happen without a lot of support, hard work, and training. And that's where our discussion this episode is going to take us. I'm speaking with Aaron Sherm, Executive Director of Meristem. And just what is Meristem? We'll get deeply into that in a moment, but it's a program, a process, a campus, and dorms for those who are neurodiverse working toward an integrated and self-sufficient lifestyle. Aaron is a graduate of Syracuse University and has put his experience as an orienteering specialist and his mentorship with the founder of Transformative Movement Education and Meristem, Maureen curran Turtletaub to work on the expansive Fair Oaks campus. He's dedicated to preparing young adults on the autism spectrum for a life of greater independence and fulfillment using his skill set and practicing the Meristem program to help those students develop and achieve their individual goals. Aaron Sherm, welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast Network. Thanks, Jeff. Great to be here. Uh, we're, we're excited. You know, I, I have to ask before we get into the real meat of the conversation, what does Meristem mean? I'm sure it has some symbolic meaning. Yeah, it's uh, so the Meristem comes from the part of the plant that has undifferentiated cells. And those cells end up being the, the, the cells that turn into um, a bigger stock, a new branch, a new leaf, et cetera. So they're like the cells that have the most potential that are often near the most uh, points of growth in a plant. And so eventually they say, hey, I need to be stronger, bigger, branch off again, and they become those things. Ah, as in potentially neural pathways. <laughs> exactly. Yep, 100%. So it's yeah. a great metaphor. We live the yeah. metaphor at Meristem. Uh, we believe that a student comes or a client shows up to Meristem and, uh, you know, there's potential. They got their, 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 they have their own potential that we try to create a, a, an environment for them to unfold into whatever they want, those new branches and leaves and so on. Bloom and flower, et cetera, et cetera. 100%. Yeah. Wonderful. We're going to get to what Meristem is, but I'd, I'd like to read something that is on your website just for the benefit of everybody because I think it's a really, really poignant phrase. What Meristem is doing is redefining the spectrum of ability, addressing one of the most significant public policy challenges we face in our state and in our society, the unacceptable unemployment rate for people with abilities who also happen to have disabilities. Meristem is unique. There's no equivalent program in our region, state, or nation. Meristem offers hope, purpose, and meaning. It's one of a kind. And... That is from Daryl Steinberg, Mayor Sacramento. He's on our board. We super appreciate him. Yeah, yeah. That, that's an amazing, just an amazing phrase. Mm. Okay, now that we've done that and we've <laughs> learned what Meristem is and we've got a, a, a great introduction to it, give us a, a high-level overview of, of what the organization is, what the school is. Yeah, so uh, Merit, the mission simply of Meristem is to support adults on the autism spectrum, neurodiversity, intellectual disabilities to develop greater independence. So oftentimes uh, an individual who's challenged uh, needs somebody to help them with daily living, get through school, et cetera, et cetera. Our program is designed to support somebody to go through a re-stepping developmental process so that 
those numbers of people that need to help that individual can kind of be be reduced, step back a little bit further, be less hands on so that that individual can uh, be productive and be doing exactly what they want to be doing in their life. Um, and yeah, so I mean, that's our that's our broad mission. Uh, we uh, yeah. OK, so so you get you say restepping reset, so to speak. What is the age of the students? that you have in the program? Yeah, we work with uh, adults mainly, so 18 plus. Um, you know, after about 28, we we check social impact. Is it, uh, you know, is this going to be a good fit for somebody who's 30 or 40 hanging out with 18-year-olds, for example? Um, a lot of that is just determined partially by funding, and then uh, we sometimes can go a little bit uh, younger to the 16 age working with Department of Rehabilitation because some of their programs allow for younger clients. Um, yeah. Okay. So in in essence, you're not taking the, the youth from early on, you know, grammar school age. You're actually taking people who maybe have been missed along the way to some degree, as I recall from the tour, and picking them up and that's what the reset is. It's, you know, they missed whatever it was from whatever age to 18, 19, 20, and starting over and rebuilding that, that neural pathway, so to speak, uh, the meristem. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, and so to me, it's, you know, one of the, there's more and more therapeutic intervention is happening um, at younger ages for autism, which is awesome. There's a lot of people that didn't get that or didn't have access to it or it wasn't around or they didn't realize they had access to it until later on. And so that's where we kind of step in with the adult-aged uh, individuals also, there's very few – like so there's individual therapies that you can go do, mm -hmm. but there's very few places that actually bring all the therapy therapies together. Uh, and so I think the, the kind of uniqueness that's even – that I would, if I were to do, if I, if I had the ability to model that both for young children and like the whole spectrum, there would be a whole, a whole progression of education that was hands-on will-based arts and crafts, um, that would basically do what we're doing, but bring somebody or much earlier through the process. But we get them at adult age and, and kind of help them go back through certain stages. You have a particular method, the Maristem method. Can you walk us through what that is and, and where did it originate? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, so the, it, it's, Maristem originally is inspired by a few different kind of key sources. So um, if I really go back, like Waldorf education, uh, Rudolf Steiner is behind Waldorf education, kind of inspired an approach to education um, that, ha that, it, Marisim has been inspired by. Um, there's a man named Angus Gordon in England who, out of that same stream, created something he calls Ruskin Mill, which does therapeutic crafts education for a variety, not just autism, but for kind of all disabilities, juvenile delinquents, etc. And uh, they they've been doing it for 20 years, uh, and so. The founders of Marisem knew Angus and kind of were inspired by Angus's work. Um, we brought that; they brought that to the U.S., put it at Maristem, and you had this kind of hybrid of a method that's really trying to touch the individual human being that we're working with, find the places where they're stuck, uh, and and through using movement as the primary modality, help them break out and reintegrate themselves at a variety of levels. And so, um, the what we know about the the nervous system is the nervous system becomes the healthiest when you have a, a, a mix of, of movement experiences. So like when I get to climb tree and swing on the swing and throw a ball and, you know, sit on a bike and all of those, the more movement experiences, the more it challenges your nervous system to differentiate yourself, which creates a lot of connections in your brain, which then ultimately when you get older leads to the higher levels of executive functioning and thinking that you might need to you know, navigate work and things like that. When that doesn't happen, when, when you don't or there's some trauma that occurs that keeps you from integrating the nervous system in some way, the way the nervous system works is it um, 
it, it gets rid of things that aren't being used. It um, atrophies at some level if you're not engaged. Uh, in some cases, if it's not differentiated, this is what spastic movement is. All the all the it, like you know the nerve all the nerves are firing your whole arm rather than being able to differentiate my pinky finger or my thumb or whatever it is. And so through you know textiles, craft, uh, the five pillars that we work with are life skills, land, movement, self leadership. Um, and we bring those together to help an individual kind of reintegrate themselves. And you went through those fast. Would you just say them again? Sure. sure. Yeah. So the five pillars that we kind of identify at Maristem are life skills. Okay. Uh, we're talking about um, hygiene, economics, Got it. stuff like that. Uh, land, which is ecology, agriculture, stewardship, uh, learning what the place is, understanding how to main, like keep and grow and 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 like kind of insert yourself into the space and then um uh stewardship is taken care of and on that land you actually have a small farm in the back where you're you're growing plants and you're growing vegetables and fruits and is that part of that integration so the students do get to experience it in a tactile way 100 percent, yeah yeah, definitely. So we, yeah, we have, we have, we're lucky that the 13 acre campus with the garden, uh, a big challenge oftentimes, uh, with autism is gut and, and nutrition health. Uh, and so a lot like to really be successful from a therapeutic standpoint, good nutrition is almost a, a foundational piece because to go through, to really fully go through developmental stages, you need the energy to be able to go through developmental stages. And some of the research that's coming out about autism is that the, mito the mitochondria of the cell, which is what produces the energy in our system, are working inefficiently. So in autism, I'm not producing the amount of energy that my body needs to you know, effectively do the amount of work that we typically do or yeah. go through developmental stages because it takes energy. Um, and so nutrition, having our own garden is, is a key to in a, for many reasons for our program. Yeah. It's amazing to think that they found it all the way down to the myocardium. You know, that, that, yeah, that, that's a, it's incredible. And I, you know, I'm still, I'm still a learner in that regard. Yeah. You know, there's some, there's a lot of people doing research on it now. And clearly uh, genetic though, because that's a gene based piece if i'm not mistaken the, you know at a cellular level yeah it's uh, no one wants to make a hard conclusion about what uh, is the, <laughs> the uh, actual okay. cause what and, they and i wasn't say, looking at yeah i wasn't yeah. implying that was the case i just think yeah. okay that's 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 a gene that dictates that cell development but but go ahead so it's a yeah it, it could be it, so what yeah. what they've i think what the conclusions that they've come to to this point is it's some sort of genetic or toxicity based factor um yes. you know in in the body so like either i'm over uh, like there is a genetic factor there that's built up over generations or i've been exposed to a, a toxic environment right. that's affect my body in some level or things like that but yeah, no one's willing know. to like pinpoint it genetics is an easier one to pinpoint but you know the other things it's, it's controversial right. yeah we know toxicity we can we can pollute something to the point of of Shuts impacting down, yep. you know facility yeah you have a, uh, a mention on the website of being person-centered. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I can interpret it, but I don't want to be incorrect in my assumption. Totally. I mean, at, at its heart, it's am I starting the conversation with you? Am I looking at who you are and what you're about and what your needs are rather than me imposing something on you that may or may not work? So what you're trying to do is assess out what does work, mm -hmm. use that as your starting point, and then get somebody to move. Now, in in – it, it, there's historical pieces in disability services because it's it, it's gone from, you know, what it used to be to the, you know, uh, centers, you know, lots of abuse in the past. Really, I mean, there's some really beautiful examples, but then there's some really negative examples. A lot of times there wasn't a consideration for the individual. And so they built this whole model of person-centered planning, which means that I'm starting a conversation with the person about the person. The cool thing about it is there's two concepts that kind of predominate person-centered planning, which is what is important for me and what is important to me. Because when it's 
not applied That's correctly. A big distinction, sure. Uh, I can say, well, I want to eat, drink Coke all day. I want to watch TV. I want to put my feet up. I, you know, like I want to just only hang out with my friends. Like, it really important stuff to me. But is it going to help me get to and and manage the things that you know, like my hygiene that will keep me healthy and the food that will make you know keep right. me sustained and stuff. So it's a balancing act between um, working with an individual to say, I hear that you want this and this is important to you. Let's do this so that you can actually have this successfully. For example, if you want a friend and you don't have any friends, like there, it's important for you to understand that if I if if I react to somebody and it's my fault and I don't apologize, um, that person's probably not going to want to be my friend anymore. So if you want a friend, it's important to be able to make repairs when issues come up so that you can have friends. <laughs> so you've, you've got that conflict resolution in play all the time, I would imagine. hundred percent, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can imagine challenging at times yeah, too. Yeah, very, very. <laughs> you know, something else that I saw when I was on campus – was the actual, I think they're part of the program, but they're, they're haptic, they're tactile experiences. There was a wood shop and art class and, and a few other uh, programs that were going on. Can you walk us through that a little bit in terms of what is encompassed for the students on the campus? Yeah, um, tons of, so within our five pillars, um, particularly the three, uh, land movement and craft, we have a, many class options. So on a craft level, we have textiles, which is weaving, knitting, sewing, crocheting, ceramics, working with clay, uh, woodworking, all sorts of different woods, metalworking, copper, steel. Then we have movement, which is like aerial arts, circus arts, uh, dancing, et cetera, and land, uh, you know, digging, planting, shoveling, mowing mowing, weed whacking, all, all that sort of stuff. Oh, with that 13 and a half acres, yeah. weed whacking and mowing is important. <laughs> Very much. I'm glad you can engage the student body to help with some of yeah. that maintenance. Yeah, and it's a great, because we use it as a tool for workforce development. So you learn these basic skills. Like I grew up mowing my own lawn, yeah. not as common these days. Um, and, you know, got to learn how to use ride mowers and things like that. When I was in college, my, one of my first jobs was landscaping. Um, that was a, a stepping stone for me, you know, in the workforce. For most of our students, they've never even had the opportunity to build the things that give you those stepping stones into the workforce. And right. so it, it, it kills two birds with one stone. Um, tag, for senses... Um, what often happens is a sense is like a two-way street and I have to build up boundaries to filter information uh, as it comes towards me from the outer world or the inner world at the end of the day. Um, and if I haven't built up those boundaries or those filters effectively, uh, those are those streets are going to be just on automatic. Everything's going to be flowing in, or everything's going to be flowing out. And ultimately, it's like you like if it if you just dump gasoline in an engine engine, it's going to flood, and then that engine shuts down and doesn't mm -hmm. work. And so the sensory, oftentimes with adult on the autism spectrum, they're they're taking in and having to consciously process 50 times more or more sensory information that we as neurotypicals or adults have have learned to just filter selectively out yeah, filter, selectively yeah. so that we're not trying to process everything like there's things that we do need to process and assimilate and integrate um but not as much as every sound that ever happens around us. Right. Um, and, and so with the nervous system to bring the nervous system back into health, like, cause it can get shut down, particularly we, we live in a world when you first enter in, it used to be like, you had, you know, you were a baby, you had like a nice warm space at home. You were exposed to very few people initially and gradually, you know, the world you, you, you entered into the world. Now you step into an environment that's super electromagnetic. There's a lot of people. If you have two working parents, you're going to be in daycare at four months, you know, if, if not sooner, yeah. uh, all those things. And so having the opportunity, especially if you're a sensitive individual, um, you don't, it, there's tra trauma or there's just like, oh man, reaction to being exposed really fast. And then my system shuts down at a variety of levels or doesn't fully integrate. And so to draw that sense back out in a healthy way, our campus is built on, on nature and, and integrating into nature so that those natural, healthy sensory experiences 
are more you're more able to assimilate them, more able to process them effectively in your body which allows you to draw out, which then allows you to rebuild those filters and those boundaries and then come up against resistance and woodworking and metalworking mm-hmm. and kind of find the limits of those and then ultimately find a balance of what's important and what's not important. You know, and to that point, the not only the sensory, but, but the touch, metal feels different than wood, me, different metals feel different uh, uh, temperatures as you heat them. Yeah. You had the, the soap making class and, and the essences and... I mean, all of that sensory, I can see where it'd be sensory overload in some cases. And if you're trying to manage it, you know, what a, what a neat way to do it because now they're getting a little bit of everything. Yeah. Even the metals, they have a smell when you heat them up, the solder, every, everything has a, you know, in, the, in that case, maybe an odor versus the fragrances on the other side. And if I'm not mistaken, they were rooms and classrooms right next to each other. So you can go from, from smelling wonderfully to something not smelling yeah, so yeah. great to the <laughs> smell of fresh wood being cut yep. to the outside grass. Yep. Hundred percent, all in ten feet, thirty feet, whatever it may yep. be. Yep, and every one of those things can elicit a response, right? And so that's where, you know, I learn to filter or to, um, you know, to integrate my nervous system at the end of the day because and get mo- a lot of experiences because you know our sensory life is built on these nerves that are, you know, if I'm talking tactile, so, you know, metals versus wood, different types of touch. I have proprioceptors in my skin that anytime something touches that, uh, I get a, I get a sensation or a response and more resistance, less resistance Mm -hmm. going deeper. The sense of touch in my experience is really like understanding the boundary of where my inner self stops and my outer self begins. And when you don't integrate that sense of touch, those boundaries get skewed. And it's like, I could be 10 feet away from you and say, Jeff, why'd you just hit me? And it's like, I I wasn't with, I was 10 feet away from you. I didn't right. touch you, but it felt like you hit me because yeah. my sense of touch is, is way too far out yeah. um, or vice versa. Uh, and so to me, it's uh, the, the different, like if we're talking tactile for a second, the different sensory experiences and the different things to touch create a, a, a plethora of movement experiences from the nervous system's perspective that allow you to, like, if I have to push against metal, I got to go a lot harder. So I got to push that sense out more. Uh, if I'm working with textiles or fine stuff, I got to refine and, and pull that back a little bit to be able to just give the amount of effort or force that I need to to work with that material. And so the spectrum helps me kind of... Uh, find the balance of that mm-hmm. of that boundary that I'm and creating. that for some of us is natural for your students with you know neurodivergency it's it's taught it's a, it's almost a skill that they have to learn yeah whereas yeah. in most cases and i may be wrong in in the way i phrase that but it comes a lot either easier or quicker to those of us who are not neurodiverse Hundred percent, yeah, and I think, you know, when your nervous system is compromised in some level, it's going to be a lot harder because you're going to be immediately starting with a traumatic response mm-hmm. rather than a healthy response to something. Um, but we live in a world now where there's a lot more time on technology. There's a lot less play in nature. There's more organized sports rather than imaginative play that we had as children, and uh, you know that's that's having the same types of effects. So I'm not getting the the amounts of movement experience that you or I might have had when we were growing up, mm-hmm. uh, less exposure to certain things and a lot more movement experiences now where, versus sitting and kind of being apathetic on the couch and you're taking in a lot of sensory information or just like imagery from a TV mm-hmm. or a screen, um, but it's not three-dimensional and it's not, um, you know, it, for lack of a better term, life-giving at the end of the day, like nature or play or being in your imagination and so on. Um, and I think all of those things are factors, you know, that like if you know, with autism or not, um, you know, we got a, a few st- students who I wouldn't even say that they're, you know, have a diagnosis of autism, but they couldn't make it through college because their nervous system just shut down the levels of anxiety, just, um, you know, made it impossible for them mm-hmm. to succeed. And uh, I think, you know, I attribute some of that to just kind of the the, the lack of health and in, in movement in our, you know, in our growing up. We'll be back with more on the Nonprofit Podcast Network right after this. I was in the media business for over 35 years and had the great privilege of working with Runyon Saltzman RSE, 
marketing, advertising, and public relations. We collaborated on many different campaigns, but their commitment to the nonprofit sector hasn't changed since their founder, Gene Runyon, started the agency. Over many years and many campaigns, Runyon Saltzman has been committed to improving lives by tackling California's most challenging issues. Guided by research-informed strategies and insightful, creative solutions, RSE develops innovative communications campaigns that raise awareness, educate, and reduce stigma in diverse communities throughout our state and beyond. To learn more about RSE, visit rs-e.com. Hello, this is Scott Thomas with CapTrust in our Sacramento office. I specialize in working with local nonprofits and associations. Annually, we survey private and public nonprofit organizations across the country to better understand challenges they see in today's environment. In our more recent survey, we heard concerns about proper board governance, mission aligned investment, and how to implement alternative investments. If you would like a copy of the survey or to discuss your organization, look me up, Scott Thomas at captrust.com. I'm thrilled to have Western Health Advantage partnering with us as they do so much to support so many nonprofit agencies in our community. As a truly local health plan, you'll find individual and family options, employer options, plans for CalPERS and Medicare Advantage. From medical services to pharmacy, health and wellness support, as well as behavioral health care, Western Health Advantage has a plan that fits what you need. As an employer, for profit or nonprofit business, individual or family, you can find more at westernhealth.com. And you mentioned college. Let me, let me ask, there's an expectation or a variety of expectations for the students that you get. Some could be just to get to a sense of independence and others could be on to college and fully independent, correct? 100%. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, to me, it's about sussing out what each – this is where the person-centered planning piece kind of comes in where you sess out what, where, one, where is somebody at. And then what's the time frame to get somewhere, mm-hmm. um, you know, and for someone who's more compromised, doing the therapeutic work that's required to really get to full independence is, you know, is really a time commitment um, on both parts, on both parts. And, you know, there's a you, know, you have to weigh like how much is it worth versus like just saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to have my some support. I'm going to, you know, go to the gym. I'm going to just do the same kind of more simple, less complex job over and over again. And that's, you know, that's that's where I think I can make it in life mm-hmm. versus the, you know, the alternative where I can get, you know, if I can overcome some of these basic things, college will unfold, a job will unfold or I'll find an environment like maybe I'm not good in person, but I'm the be- like, you know, one of our students, um, 20% faster than anyone at entering Excel sheet data. If there's any nuance in the process, he he shuts down and walks away. But if he mm-hmm. has this, if they have the steps faster than anyone there is mm-hmm. really. And that's like, you know, kind of a cool thing about autism. You have these like superpowers at some right. level that allow you, but it, that you, pivoting is not an easy thing. Right. Um, so it's gotta be set up right. And so some, you know, for some, you can find that, carve that space out in the workforce or something like that where they can be super successful and and be helpful. How many students can you accommodate? What's capacity? Yeah, it's, I I think we're hitting our upper limit. We're at 50 right now. I think all told 70 would probably be like what, uh, what we can comfortably support on our campus. But, you know, we're going, we have three different pieces of our program. So we have uh, living skills training. We have our day program, which is the land movement craft. Then we have the whole work skills arm. Um, We're starting to differentiate those almost as separate businesses in some way. And I'd say for the day program, the upper limit's probably 70. Mm -hmm. Um, Our dorm capacity for living is probably 40 um and we we're just starting to scratch the surface of how many people we can touch from the work skills standpoint i think eventually we're going to expand beyond the maristem campus at some levels um where you know we can do, we can offer some of the ways in which we work in principal form not on maristem's campus and that might increase that number exponentially so it almost environmentally in the workforce or, exactly. or whatever it might yep. look like. Yeah, 100%. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. In the, uh, in the in the sense of capacity and students, you have students from all over the country. 
Yeah, correct. Uh, it used to be a lot more from around the country. COVID happened and kind of killed movement. Um, now we have just a few individuals from out of state, uh, a number of people from different areas of California, and then yeah, probably about half local. Okay. What does it take? How does one get involved? How do you get either your child or the student get themselves into the program? Uh, great question. Yeah. Uh, so one, find us. <laughs> right, right. That's, uh, find us and reach out. I know it's all on the website, but you got to yeah. get to that website yeah. and realize there's something exactly exists. And I think word of mouth's growing. I think sometimes that's better than even social media can do because, you know, with some parents talking to someone else's parent and then all of a sudden that just networks. In uh, ways. And that network tends to be very, very tight. If you have yep. an autistic child or a, a child with severe disabilities, yeah. you tend to gravitate toward people with like situations. There, there you go. And then you're off and running. Yeah. Yeah. So we rely on that. And then, uh, you know, you, you reach out, um, we have a, a fairly rigorous, like just, you know, we ask for kind of all the documentation. Um, usually if you have some sort of disability, you're going to have uh, an indi indiv in individualized education plan, an IEP or uh, individual person plan, IPP, uh, along with, you know, maybe some psychological assessments and, and a variety of things. Um, when you come and live, so for Maristem, we ask that somebody has their basic kind of they can manage themselves at a basic level. That means like I can toilet myself, I can, you know, put clothes on hygiene. myself, high, basic hygiene, I, and I can kind of show up and, and go through a day without one-to-one -one support. Um, if you meet those standards, um, then usually, you know, assuming there's a fit, we what we would do once looking at that paperwork, have you come for a three-day visit. Uh, we call it a PEV. Um, there we kind of really get to know you a little bit better, see what the fit is, and then after that we'd offer enrollment. And that's that's you, the individual, as well as the support system, the parents, the the guardian, whatever it happens to be who's working with that, that student? Yeah, the, the parent guardian would probably come for a tour, get to know it. They The parent wouldn't be there for the three days. So oh, really what wonderful. we try to do is have that individual alone for three days to kind of see what you know what we're working with mm -hmm. um, without intervention and, yeah. or, um, or influence yeah exactly yeah exactly <laughs> really um, he's okay he doesn't, yeah this never happens exactly. at all <laughs> yeah um, and so uh, that's a really helpful step and then you know from that our instructors all you know put in their assessment and we kind of gauge, hey, is this going to work? Is this not mm -hmm. going to work? You know, is there, are they ready? They're not ready. Are there areas where they're ready? It might be like, hey, you're not quite ready for the dorms, but you can engage in the day program. Um, yeah. You mentioned instructors. Tell me a little bit about the instructors. How many people do you have employed? We're about at 70 now. Wow. Um, that's a lot of people. Yeah. So we, you know, we have some support at nighttime, but we're, we, we're, we're supporting 24-7. Mm -hmm. Um we have you know, instructors there all weekend. We have instructors during the day. We have a second shift in the evening. Um, and it's a mix. So mo probably half of our instructors, it's hard because of our kind of the uniqueness of the, the offerings that we have for the program. There's not really good educational models to have like a college degree in in what we do at the end of yeah. the day so for the most part we either say like you have a bachelor's or kind of similar experience uh in either a field of disability and or an expertise in the area that we're hiring for i.e metals or wood or uh movement of some level and then try to skill our staff up uh mm -hmm. in working with autism disabilities etc um so predominantly it's you know there's a there's probably a number of our employees who are in process of college and like let's say as an ILS instructor it's not a bad job to work on the weekends you know make some money and then you go to college during the week uh, but most for of the our, benefit of us who don't know ILS oh is. yeah excuse me yeah independent living skills got it um and so yeah so, so some of our independent living skills instructors um you know, are in college and school, so they'll they they you know get hired for like an overnight shift or a weekend shift. But then most of our weekday instructors, particularly in the day program, all have been doing this for five years or have a bachelor's in something um, or or higher level education. Mm -hmm. And then do you have uh, 
higher, higher level for some of the, the therapies that you work with, or is that necessarily not something you get into there? Yeah, we don't get into it, particularly Maristem, but we do, like, for example, uh, have an art therapist who operates on our campus. Uh, we have you know, good relationships with families to where we can get information from their psychologists and have back and forth dialogue with them so that they can give us mm -hmm. information and we can set up supports. Um, eventually, I think we'd love to have more of those ther therapists with that higher level degree, you know, like a registered dietitian, um, you know, an OT, et cetera. Um, OT is? Uh, occupational therapist, Thank physical you. therapist. Um, yeah, a few of those. Everybody's got their acronyms yeah i know it's we, crazy we, we don't all yeah. know them all <laughs> there's a lot of them especially yes. there's a few communities that love their acronyms yeah, i right. feel like disability community is one of those <laughs> um yeah so we'd love to get there but the way the the so what makes marisem a th i think a therapeutic educational program is the design of it mm -hmm. um and it's the system that provides the therapy. And so as an instructor, I just need to implement kind of the curriculum that I'm implementing. But the holistic design of it all is what steps somebody through their, you know, re-stepping process of mm -hmm. developmental stages. Um, and so we're able to accomplish that with the system. And then, you know, as different interventions are needed, we can suggest, hey, talk to this type of person. Sure. Yeah. You know, before we get into the next question, give me an example. I'm, I'm sure you have some really interesting characters, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and I mean that in, in, the, in the kindest way and the neatest way. Yeah. It, somebody that's gone through the program, you know, is successful on the outside. Share a story with us. Yeah. Um, there's a few good ones. I mean, uh, I'll start with... Uh, like Harry, who started as a Maristem student, um, went through Maristem, then got a job after Maristem, became a job coach, um, and then came back to Maristem as the the basically the face of transformative autism program. And so he's the one now going out uh, to presentations of hundreds of people about how employers can integrate adults with autism into the and, workforce. And, and look, I'm one of them. Exactly. Right. Yeah. He starts there and he, you know, he's still autistic. You can tell yeah. like just who he is, um, but he does it. And it's, that's a pretty awesome story. Um, and, and, Harry also co-hosts a podcast with you that you do for the school, if I'm not mistaken. Hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. And Voices of the Community podcast. Uh, we talk about workforce and work-related uh, topics and interview kind of the journey of different students um, and other employers and kind of how it's been. So yeah, he's yeah. that's a great story. Um, so people can actually listen to the podcast and hear Harry if they want to say, well, I don't know, what's he talking about? I hear how this guy. Yeah. Yeah, you can hear. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, 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 a great, it's a great testimony to engagement. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, it, it works at the end in many ways. I, I think um, there's, you know, just for – well, you know, another good, another really good story also on our podcast is Ben Lewis, Maristem student, um, tried college before Maristem, couldn't do it, uh, came to Maristem, actually finished Maristem, worked on the land for two years at Maristem, then was like, I'm ready to go on my own, went back to college. In doing college, he realized I can do this, but I don't want to I do this. I choose not to. I choose not to. And now, like he could consciously say, it's not that I can't do it, but I have the, I have the capacity to. I just don't want to. Um, and so now he's uh, he figured out a way to get the 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 support um, that he can get to. Uh, do an internship to work on the land a couple days a week. And then he does other work other days a week at Maristem uh, and just kind of looking for the next best thing. Um, so that's, that was, a, that's another really kind of cool him. story. And I guess the last one, which is really, you know, kind of, peripherally Maristem Not the last, oriented. but the next one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, 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 it's we, gonna don't be, want, yeah. we don't want you to have a last No, <laughs> well, I don't think we will. Um, uh, a young man down in... Um, you know, the South Bay area reached out to our TAP, Transformative Autism Program, which is an online training, which we work with job employers and job seekers. Um, and he was looking for a job and uh, we had just put 
Oracle through our uh, transformative autism program. And uh, then Oracle is like, we're in. And we ended up connecting that young man and Oracle together. Uh, and he did an internship. And then he recently just got a full-time job offer oh, that's at Oracle. Wonderful. Uh, and so to me, it's like a, just a great example of, you know, we have our campus, but with our transformative autism program, we're really focused around the state. And that was a nice kind of little pi picture of how we could help somebody and an employer come together. Um, you know, and it's an Oracle. So it's not right. just a like, you know, I got the bagging job at Rayleigh's. It's like I'm in tech, like yes. doing my thing. Yes. Um, and a full time job offer as an not end, to minimize that cool. bagging job at Rayleigh's. Not we, at all. We just had yeah. them on last week. Yeah, love it. <laughs> and they're one of our. You know, honestly, we have a great relationship. They're one of our best employer, like employer relationships oh, so in glad terms we said of that. stepping yes. stones for our students. And again, not knocking the the bagging job. Uh, at all, you know, that's, it needs to happen. You need, yes. those, you need those jobs. Like we need every job. Um, and it's just, you know, for a lot of our students it's a stepping stone and, uh, maybe it's, it's the job that they can do. Um, and yeah. it's a union job. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's decent pay and they can, they can earn a living wage 100%. doing that, which yeah. is, is fantastic. Yeah. I love when you get a scam likely come through when you're doing an interview. <laughs> yeah. The, the next function that is of significance for any organization, nonprofit, and, and even for-profit, is funding. Mm. How are you funded? And in your case, you've got a, a multitude of things. You've got housing, which is significant. You've got the facility itself, and then you've got your programs. So you're a little bit more multifaceted in the things that you need than you know a single source, somebody who's not on 13 and a half acres, somebody yeah. who, who doesn't have housing. You know, how do you get funded? Um, it, it's 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 challenging and complicated. Um, our main sources of funding currently are uh, we're vendored with the regional center and regional center is um, uh there's 21 regional centers around the state of California. They're non-for-profit organizations. In our area, it's Alta Regional Center, California. And uh, they get the funding from the Department of Disabilities and and do and kind of basically vet and assess all the people who are providing services and the clients who are um, you know looking for those services and then provide funding to programs like Maristem for the services that we provide for the clients that are vendored with Regional Center. Um, so they provide that, you know, if you're a regional center client, they will pay for our day program. They'll pay for our ILS support. The only thing they don't pay for is housing and food in our program. Um, we have, you now, know, so, so does that get paid for by the students own means in some way, shape or form? The housing, yes, yeah, yeah. It does. So okay. the the parents so like have a dorm to dorm at a college. Yep, yeah. Okay. So the parents would have to come up with that. It's like room and board at a college, yes. as okay. you said. Yep. Um, and then there is private pay, so people might pay for the whole program personally. Uh, and then uh, there's what's now a new avenue of funding from the state called self determination. And so basically, instead of Alta California and Maristem being uh, having a contract where they pay us, basically Alta and the individual come up with a budget that that individual gets. That money is put into a financial management institution, and then that individual can say, I want to use this money for Maristem, or I want to use this money to go uh, take swim lessons, or I want to use this money to go get therapy or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and so they get to have their pot of money, which they determine where it goes. Uh, and so we accept uh, self-determination money as well. And then you know, with everything that you described, there's all these a like aspects of Maristem that currently covers, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60% of what we need to operate. And so the rest of it is grants, fundraising, um, and, you know, praying a little bit. <laughs> sure, sure. Un understood, especially yeah. with the budget situation we're about to encounter. Totally. You know, in the, in the, uh, um, the fundraising part of it, is there any significant event that you do that's a once a year that's your big annual or something to that effect that you want to share? Yeah, we have uh, three um, in the in 
you know, winter time, it's like November, December, we do what we call the Feast of Wreaths. And it's a, um, it's a fundraising event on our campus. So, you know, we have tables, it's a great dinner. We usually highlight a chef uh, from the area to come and cook or a local restaurant. Last year we had Shangri-La. Um, and it's just a fun evening. It's students do some presentations. You get to hear a little bit from parents and, um, you know, different people in the program just about, you know, what Maristem is. And it's just mm-hmm. a good evening. Um, Feast of Reason. Then we do Awaken the Possible in the spring. Um, shout out to Phil Angelitas, who's who kind of helps us put that event on. Uh, and it's it's a kind of a simpler event. It's more like raising money beforehand and show up and you know a little a little presentation and gratitude and enjoy some food and hors d'oeuvres and hanging out. And then we're a part of the big day of giving, um, sure. where you know those are kind of our three big ones. Okay, if you Take a step back, and you, you're you talking to a captive audience now, people who are listening, if they've gotten this far, they have an interest in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Uh, or, or they're interested parents or grandparents, somebody in the family, support of some, some way, shape, or form. What would you say is the biggest need you've got? What would you ask them, you know, at this point? Hmm. Yeah, I mean... Um... Fundraising is always huge. Uh, you know, some people can give more, some people can give less. So, you know, anything that you can give goes, you know, pulls up and counts. Mm-hmm. Um, I think word of mouth is helpful. Connections, you know, like maybe you can't give, but you know somebody who might be interested. Um, that's huge. Uh, we're also starting to build out an endowment fund. Um, Wonderful. Which would, yeah. you know, kind of help us just create some ongoing revenue, which makes life a little bit easier on the fundraising side of things. Um, we are, we run that fund through Sacramento Region Community Foundation, who mm-hmm. runs Big Day of Giving. Yep. Uh, and so that fund is there that you can always donate to, or if, you know, long term, you know, you're thinking about your will or something like that and you want to give some money away, like we, we do the long term fundraising stuff as well. Um, so, you know, think of Maristem. I think to me, um, we always have fund needs, uh, things that, you know, like, cause budgets tight in the program. It's like, it'd be like, our land is a lot to take care of. We need a tractor. We don't have 25 K to buy a tractor. Like, but, and so there's this like, oh man, we need this, but we, we yeah. can't afford it. There's, there's a lot of those little, those things that, um, you know, can help for the program and you can reach out if there's of interest, you know, of what, what specific I'm going to clarify ones. that tractor yeah. comment for anybody that's never been to the facility. Yeah. You know, we think you need a lawnmower and you get this little riding tractor like at, yeah. at Home Depot for six grand. Why does he need a $25,000 tractor? Because if you saw the property, yeah. you would realize he needs a big tractor with a big mower behind it and something that could probably even backhoe and a hundred percent, you know, yeah. do some tilling for the property where you're farming. Exactly. It yep. is, is quite the facility. And if anybody's interested, I would really encourage you to, to visit the campus because it's spectacular yeah. in, in so many different ways. And yep. just the, the calmness that exists there where you've got the, uh, the, the, the shops and, and the classrooms, so to speak, uh, all the way back to the dorms. And the dorms were impressive. They were much nicer than my college <laughs> dorm, I <laughs> yeah. can tell you that. And they're, they're better maintained from what I saw. So, you know, just just such an impressive facility. How does somebody go about getting in touch with you if they're interested? Uh, Yeah, info at maristem.pro. So I-N-F-O at maristem, M-E-R-I-S-T-E-M dot pro, P-R-O. That'll generally get it. You can reach out to me directly, Aaron, E-R-I-N at maristem.pro. I am a man and it is E-R-I-N, just if anyone's confused. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, those two. Uh, we have a website, maristem.pro. Um, that's a good way to just look up a little bit more information. Uh, if you send a message to info um, at uh, set up a tour, we also have a cafe open on Fridays. Stop by, grab lunch, walk around uh, 1130 to 130. Feel free to just kind of be in our community for a little bit. Um, yeah. you, you, you just mentioned something. The, the cafe is open on Fridays, which is, is really neat. I want to get a client over there or two just for them to experience it and get you know, a taste of something that is, is different. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can go to Shangri-La or we can go to Maristem. What yeah. are your choice? And I'll know what their 
propensity for giving is. I love it. But the other part of that that we, we didn't touch on, and I, you brought it back to my attention, is the students actually make things on campus that you sell. Yeah. And and what are some of those things? Yeah. Uh, one I'm sure good, it's not a lot of money, but it's it's something. No, it's yeah, something. It's, it's little stuff, you know, but um, – uh, you know, like in the program, for example, we have an herbal arts CSA. If you go on any of our social media, Facebook, uh, Maristem, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, there's a link to an herbal arts CSA. And that's basically like you will get a box of homemade soap, a special handmade tea, uh, maybe a spray, like a mosquito spray, all made from herbs picked from our our land put together uh and you can get like a year subscription where you get four boxes or just a one-off so that's something that some of our students get paid they're in a paid internship and they create that um there's uh you know, they'll make uh, ceramic cups for example and sell those in the cafe um I think the you know, and then some of our students just have small social enterprises so like Darren one of our students for example makes um or intricate ornaments for your Christmas tree and has, you know, hundreds of them that he'll sell at our Christmas fair or not Christmas, our winter fair um, that happens in December. And so you can see uh, a mix of craft craft projects that they'll make. Uh, yeah, that's neat. Which is cool. Yeah, that's yeah. neat. Well, Aaron, the way you're working with our neurodiverse community and the individuals preparing them for society, it, it really helps our community so, so much. You know, it, it gives them a pathway. It gives them an opportunity. It gives them hope, gives their parents hope, gives their, their support system hope that, you know, that student is going to engage into some semblance of independence. So for what you do at Maristem, thank you so much. We, we appreciate it. The community appreciates it. And you help us be a better place. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we appreciate your support. Um, yeah, we love the community and the community has been good to us. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If what you heard moved you, please reach out to that organization and do what you can to help. If you like and appreciate what we're doing to support local nonprofits, please give us a positive review, subscribe, and share. If you're a nonprofit with an interest in participating in an episode, you can reach me at jeff at hearmenowstudio.com. If you have a need for the services or products our sponsors offer, please reach out to them. CapTrust, Fiduciary Advice for Endowments and Foundations, Runyon Saltzman Incorporated, RSE, Marketing, Advertising, and Public Relations, Creating Integrated Communications Committed to Improving Lives, and Western Health Advantage, a full-service health care plan for individuals, employer groups, and families. The Nonprofit Podcast Network is a production of, is recorded at, and edited by Hear Me Now Studio.